This is the SFF Audio Podcast. I'm Scott. And this is Jesse. Good morning, Jesse. What's going on? Um, not much. <laughs> not How about much with up you? There. With lots, me, right? yeah, lots. Had a great time. Uh, I went to uh, science fiction symposium. They call it a symposium because uh, it's it's more of an academic conference at a uh, university. It was at uh, BYU in Provo, Utah, and there's no uh, like gaming section or or anything like that. It's all panels. And uh, it was Brigham really Young. terrific. Brigham, it Brigham Young University. Yep. Just figured it out. <laughs> Brigham Young University. Yeah, the guest of honor was Tracy and Laura Hickman um, of the Dragonlance fame. Mm-hmm. And um, Brandon Sanderson, uh, who wrote Elantris and Mistborn, and is currently writing the last book of uh, Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time. You should have brought your kid to that one. I did. I brought Chris. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. How was yeah. that? Uh, it was great. Chris is 14. Loved it. Cool. Had a great time, yeah. You Very bet. Cool. Yeah, one of the, the highlights for me, um, I don't know if I've mentioned this podcast before, um, writingexcuses.com. Yeah, you have. Okay. Well, you've mentioned it to me anyways. Okay. <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's a excellent podcast about writing. Um, it's 15 minutes a week. And they recorded two episodes uh, live at the convention, or I keep calling it, yeah, the convention. <laughs> and um, the, the Writing Excuses podcast stars uh, three writers, Brandon Sanderson, who I just mentioned, um, a fellow named Dan Wells, who his first novel is coming out um, in a couple of weeks in the UK. It's called I Am Not a Serial Killer. <laughs> Good title. And, yeah, and uh, it'll be out in the United States in April. Anyway, I'm really looking forward to reading that. Um, and the third person... And you know, that'll be great to hold up on the bus while you're going to work, you know, you just mm -hmm. sit there holding the holding the self-help book. I'm uh -huh. not a serial killer. Yeah, they were, they were giving out buttons, little buttons that says, I am not a serial killer that you could put on Very your nice. shirt. Very nice. Yep, it was excellent. Very nice. And the third uh, person is Howard Taylor. He does a web comic called uh, Schlock Mercenary. Um, SchlockMercenary.com. That's S C H L O C K M E R C E N A R Y dot com. And um, anyway, it's a terrific podcast. It's very tight, very quick, super fast pace. Uh, they keep it to 15 minutes, and they recorded two episodes uh, here. What was that? The panels or? Just no, no, no. They recorded uh, just episodes of, of the Writing Excuses. They brought in Tracy Hickman as a guest and then um, just talked about writing for 15 minutes, wrapped it, and then started again and uh, recorded for 15 minutes and wrapped it. Hmm. Yep. It's an excellent podcast. I highly recommend it to, to anybody. I guess we should talk faster, huh? <laughs> yep. Match their speed. Right. Well, right. um, that sounds good. But yep. You. What about the convention panels you were on? Did you record them? Yeah. Or did they get recorded. Did I record any of them? No, I did not. Um, okay. The one, the one I was on on that day, right after the recording of the Writing Excuses uh, podcast, in a different room was a panel called Podcasting for Writers, and which was kind of neat because everybody who was there for the recording of Writing Excuses went to that panel. I mean, there was must have been 130 people there. And I was the moderator for the panel. And there was seven people on the panel um, besides myself. So you had those three guys, um, a fellow named Bob Defendi, who is podcasting um, some writing he's done. And I need to look that up and uh, give that a listen. He's a excellent guy. And then uh, Tracy and Laura Hickman were also on that panel. Um, Tracy has done, he's podcast novels. Um, well, I don't know about novels, but the one that kind of leaps to mind is... Uh, Immortals. Uh, yeah, The Immortals, yeah. And I think that's available on Audible now, he said. Oh, really? Yep. So, um, 
I, I think it's Patio Books was the first yeah, place. Yeah, Patio Books is where it started. Yeah, we talked about Patio Books for just briefly. <clears throat> um, and let's see. Yeah, that's everybody that was on the panel, I believe. Yeah, so you, you had Brandon Sanderson, Dan Wells, Howard Taylor. Oh, uh, Jordan Sanderson, who is Brandon's brother, does all of the tech crew stuff for the podcast. And uh, he was a great source of information. And yeah, then, no uh, doubt. Yeah, and then Bob Defendi, and Tracy and Laura Hickman, and then myself. So yeah, which one of these people doesn't belong up there? <laughs> it was neat. Wow, you so, you've written something. And oh yeah, you sure. A little bit of audio, and you've sure. got a website related to it. So yeah, it was fun. It was fun. So yeah, with that many people on the on the panel, it was very easy to moderate. I just kept it moving. If there were, you know, if we stopped, I I threw another question out, and then uh, there was another round of discussion. So, there was another panel you were on, though, right? Yeah, the other panel I was on was um, the Golden Age of Science Fiction. And um, that one was with uh, David Farrow and Eric Swedeen and a fellow named Janice Daniels. And they're all local. Uh, uh, Eric, Swedeen, Eric Swedeen has written a review for us for an uh, H.P. Yeah. Lovecraft title. And uh, he's also a professor up at Weber State University. Um, good. We got some professors on staff. Yeah, yeah. He's a doctor. He's oh, a doctor. Good. Yeah. So. Need a resident doctor. That's right. <laughs> anyway, it was fun. It was really enjoyable. It, uh, I, I brought my uh, science fiction hall of fame volume one, because you know when I think golden age, I always think short fiction, and uh, that's the best collection I know of yeah. of uh, golden age science fiction short stories, and it's it's funny I mention it because. Uh, David Farrow, as soon as I pulled my book out and said, you know, hey, this is a great place, you know, every story in here but one is Golden Age, you know, mm -hmm. and then uh, he says, I also brought a book, and it was the same one. <laughs> yeah, so. I, I've got a copy of one of those. Um, there's so, uh, It might be volume two or three. Mm -hmm. um, very good. Yeah. You know, I would love to see an audio collection of Golden Age science fiction. Um, well, just an audio collection of that would be fine. Oh, it would be incredible. Don't even if it have was to that, mix it, it up be, at all. It would be absolutely remarkable because, yeah. yep, I mean, this is where it all came from, really. Yep. And, uh, yeah, it was it was fun to discuss. Cool. So, yeah, from the audio standpoint, um, Brandon Sanderson, uh, Elantris, has been released by Recorded Books, and we put a review of that on SFF Audio. Mm -hmm. He also told me that Elantris is going to be released as in a dramatized version as well. Hmm. Um, I don't like know the audio publisher. Drama, I don't drama. know the publisher, but it sounded like it. I don't know. I don't want to get it wrong because. Um, but but it's going to be you know the attributives have been dropped and the um, actors and things like that. So I'm not sure who's going to publish it. But he told me yeah you sell dramatization rights separately from audiobook rights sure. and sure. and so he did that for Elantris. Well, cool. the Mistborn series, Macmillan Audio started with volume 3 because that was the latest volume coming out. So Mistborn volume 3 is available on Audible and then they've gone back and they're redoing the other ones or they're redoing <laughs> they're, they're doing they're recording the other ones and the first one is out. So you've got volume 1 and volume 3 on audible.com. Um Macmillan Audio, uh, exclusive to Audible. And he's hard at work on the, the last book of the Wheel of Time. Right. Which he says is going to be giant. <laughs> it's going to be a big book. Not so, a lot of threads to wrap up. Yep, a lot of things to wrap up. Um, also there, um, Lee Modisett, L.E. Modisett Jr., has written lots and lots of books, but has nothing on audio that I know of until uh, next month. Um, he's starting a new fantasy series, um, the first book of which is called Imager. And right, Tant I spotted Tant that. Right, and Tantor is releasing that in March. I spotted uh, that in the Tantor catalog after you mentioned it. Great, great. Yeah, and it's read by William DeFries, so we know that's going to be good. Yep, that'll be good. Um, David Farland was also there, of Rune Lord's fame. Um, He's also got some audio out there. Uh, the Rune Lords is the first novel. I think it's called The Sum of All Men, 
Is yeah, we subtitle. talked about that um, yeah. maybe 10 podcasts back. Sure, and it's from Blackstone Audio. Mm-hmm. And he's also got um, a youth series that I love. I, I read the first book aloud to my daughter. It's called Of Mice and Magic, and mm-hmm. it's also available on audio. The second book in that series is called uh, The Wizard of Ooze. Where's that? Uh, who's got that? Um, I believe it's a local Utah publisher. Um, but I've heard some of it, and it's very well done. Um, oh, we should get a listing for it. Yeah, we should. I, I was trying to... I don't have that book in here. Um, it, it could be Covenant, I believe, is what comes to my mind. Okay. Um, th- there's several publishers here in Utah. Um, Audiobook pu- publishers? Yeah, and they, they, they publish audio as well. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. It's all really for the LDS market. Yeah, but um, mm-hmm. in, in in this case, it's um, just a regular fantasy book, right? Um, yeah, of mice and magic is a youth, uh, a YA fantasy. Yep. Right. Um, okay, uh, Eric James Stone. He's a, a writer. He writes short stories, mostly published in Analog, and uh, the Intergalactic Medicine Show. He's probably published, um, I don't know. I'm guessing eight uh, short stories to date. And uh, his latest story is in Analog in March 2009 issue, which That's I happen current. to have on my phone. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, because you have a Sharpie, you could uh, sign this phone for me. That sounds good. Yeah. Um, but he's on audio in the uh, Intergalactic Medicine Show collection that is on Audible. Oh, right. Um, yeah. Have we, we, we haven't got done, a anyth- I haven't done anything. I haven't done anything with that yet. Mm-hmm. Um so I'll download that later. He he was asking me if I knew who narrated his story, because he couldn't find any attribution. So, oh, um, that's I said I said well, there's a chance I'll know who did it. So, um, if not, I'll find out. Uh, was that through Blackstone or was it just straight to Audible? You know, I think it was Macmillan, because oh. Macmillan does all of Orson Scott Card's stuff. That makes sense. So I think it was another Macmillan audio exclusive to Audible. And then um, one other f- person I want to mention uh, is James Dashner. He wrote a book called The Thirteenth Reality, The Journal of Curious Letters, also available on audio, and I don't know the imprint on that. Um, our library, our local library has it. Um, but he's got another book coming out uh, from Random House called Maze Runners, and I think that that's going to come out in September. And I'm fairly certain that that's going to have an audio release as well. Um, more more YA fiction. No, I was just thinking how s- surprising that, that the everybody's got audio stuff, but I guess if it was a panel <laughs> full of audio mm-hmm. people, <laughs> it's not that Yeah, bad. those, uh, the, uh, Modisit, Eric James Stone, Farland, and Dashner, those those were not on that panel. They're on the classic one, yeah, you're saying. No, 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 no. They were just at the convention. Ah, uh. Right. Okay, the, gotcha. the classic one was myself, Eric Swedeen, David Farrow, and Janice Daniels. All right. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. So how was the convention otherwise? It was really, really fantastic. It, it was one of those conventions that was kind of on the uh, chopping block. Wasn't certain that uh, it was going to happen mm-hmm. um, because it's free. It's, it's sponsored by a department at the university, cool. and it's free every year. So anyone, you know, all the students can go. And, uh, you know, it's really pitched from the academic standpoint, you know, looking at science fiction as literature. Um, It's been going for 27 years. So uh, Orson Scott Card was the guest of honor last year. One of the two, Gail Carson Levine, uh, she wrote Ella Enchanted. She Mm -hmm. was another guest last year. And um, Orson Scott Card is an alumni, BYU alumni. Anyway, apparently some some things happened involving Orson Scott Card uh, that made sure that this was going to happen this year. Oh. Um, and it was in the newspaper. Um, so he kind of uh, stepped to the plate and said, hey, this needs to survive. And he talked to the people that he knew, and, and next thing you know, it happened. And, the power uh, of, of Card. <laughs> yeah. So it looks like um, it's good for next year as well. Um, I think anyway, uh, it, it was ex- it was very well attended. I mean, these panels were packed. I well, mean, there was going to help, but um, yeah, I mean, but that's cool. 
Yeah, to have a, a hundred and thirty or so people, and that that was just a guess, but it was standing room only in that room, you know. Um, so yeah, it was really terrific. University campus is where it was held. Yep, yep, yeah. right on campus in the student it makes center. Makes a lot of sense, just you know, for the facilities mm -hmm. and such. Yeah. And that was on the weekend, so it's not going to be jam packed. Yeah, it was Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yeah. I went to Friday, Saturday. Yep. Cool. Yep, it was terrific all around. It was just neat, you know. And there's a bookstore in the uh, in the student center, so all the signings happened in the bookstore, and the bookstore had everybody's books on hand. So of course I came home with a pile, <laughs> <laughs> like I always do. And then you know, oh, I want to read all this. I want to read all this, and then got to bring your own stuff to sell there to 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 um, offset. Mm -hmm. Better start writing. Yeah. Just, just so you can offset the costs. Of That's right. That's a good small. point. It's a very good point. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I was looking at um, audible.com when I, I, I looked up this morning. I looked up the uh, IGMS collection, the Intergalactic Medicine Show. Anyway, they have a new thing on there. If you go to your My Library area, it's a lot of your audiobooks have a new enhanced format. It says, new enhanced format on Audible. Enhanced is our premium quality audio format. It does not use the word stereo, um, but mm. I hope that it is, uh, because those audio dramas like, you know, Hitchhiker's Guide and stuff, it's a shame to hear those in, in mono. <laughs> you need stereo to hear those things. Right. Um, so, but not all the devices are supported. Um, I, I, I looked it up just this morning, and it says the iPod Classic Generation 6 and up is supported. And I have no idea what generation my iPod is. I don't even know how to find out. So I'm going to have to look up. Look it up. Um, I think your, if yours is a generation it's 2. A thir 30 gig. How many generation? How long, How many years has it been since you bought one? Oh, two? Yeah, it should work, uh, Good. I believe. Um, I hope so. Barely. Barely, yeah. Barely. I believe. If if yours is actually says classic, then it will work. Okay. Um, the original iPods didn't say classic. They were just the iPod, right? Let's see what I've got here. And then to distinguish it, once once they started selling the, um, the uh, iPod Nano, they s had to start giving it a separate name. Well, it doesn't say classic anywhere on it. Does it say video on the back? Nope, just says iPod. Uh, so I may be in trouble. No, I think you'll be all right. Let's see. You, yours looking. has yours has um, uh, color screen. Go about. And displays yep. uh, video. A, yep. Not well. Yeah, it, you're fine. Well, you're that's fine. cool. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I know it doesn't do like the movie rentals and stuff. I can't do that on this one. Um, well, then maybe you're screwed. I don't Version know. Version 1.3, it says. So what's the difference? Here it says, with Enhanced, you can listen to your favorite audiobook as if you're with your narrator in the recording booth, bringing classics to life and adding an extra crisp and clear dimension to the bestsellers. Over <laughs> 11,000 audiobooks are already available and we'll be adding most of the catalog throughout the next year, as well as making sure... Any new audiobooks added to the site will be optimized, enhanced. Get ready to enjoy the best audiobook listening you've ever experienced. It sounds to me just like higher quality sound. Um, it's not like uh, yeah um, anything radical other than that. Sure. Um, but yeah, it doesn't say. Uh, I'm just gonna. Yeah, look it didn't say stereo, and that that's what the enhancement they really need. Um, so I, I was surprised that they didn't, you know, shout that from the rooftops if it was stereo. It says CD sound quality. Does that imply stereo? Um, no. I don't think Star it does. sound quality is similar to CD. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, AM radio, FM radio, MP3, and then CD. Level 4 is... What happened to level 1? <laughs> level 1 is gone? I guess so. History... Yeah. I find level one was not listenable. It's quite large. One file size, yeah, it's double the size. So it's just, you know what, it's just uh, like 128 kilobytes. Oh, okay. It's probably what it is. Okay. Good to know. 
Hey, yeah. I, I swapped some uh, that's email with... That's unfortunate uh, that they didn't include stereo as one of the... Well, you know, I guess we don't know that they didn't, but... Well, I'll download some with, with the natural stereo yeah, sound. Yeah, we just need to download a, yeah. a, a drama. And you know, any it. of those Star Wars books will have it. Yeah, you're right. Would have it if they could. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Um, I talked to uh, Halo Williams at Blackstone this week. Oh, yeah? Um, I, I just asked her about the, the Harlan Ellison... I had heard uh, uh, quite a while back that Harlan Ellison was going to release another um, short story collection. So this would be the third. And that Blackstone Audio was going to release that and then re-release his first two, which were not Blackstone titles at the time. Um, they were fantastic audio titles, which um, I, I guess doesn't exist anymore. Um, anyway, she told me the new Harlan Ellison collection is coming very, very soon, so hopefully Good. within a month we'll see that. Um, she also mentioned uh, Stir of Echoes by Richard Matheson. Mm -hmm. um, said Scott Brick considered that one of uh, his favorite projects ever. Cool. So that'll be cool. And then she mentioned that they got the rights for Passage by Connie Willis, which is her latest novel. Um, she's got one more coming out, but I haven't been able to find a, a release date um, called All Clear um, on Connie Willis's site. It, I it bet looks like she's handed that in. That's what? I bet it's set in London during the Blitz. Yeah, that sounds, is correct. Sounds totally like what it yeah. would be about. Totally correct, yeah. I, I and, noticed uh, that they uh, Blackstone just released Bellwether. Um, right. Well, right. Mm -hmm. uh, just this month. Um, now I've heard that uh, I heard a uh, abridged version done for uh, CBC Radio. Oh, uh, it's hard to get a hold of, but um, it was uh, a pretty good novel. It's it's not very science fictiony though. It's um, it's uh, it's about chaos theory, and it's about a bunch of people who work at a company who um, are studying uh, um, how chaos theory works. It's sort of like luck, you know. It's sort of about luck. I see. But yeah, it's it's um it's going to be interesting to hear a uh, an unabridged version. I, although I hear maybe I ha I'm not going to get that. <laughs> Is that oh. right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's oh. already it was requested the moment the moment that uh, yeah it, it we found out it existed. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. That is right. Um, but yeah, Be continues. Bellwether is a very short book. It's surprising that it was abridged. You you remember the uh, the old Roger Zelazny and Amber novels? Yeah, <coughs> those are very short books, and they came out in an abridged format, which um, really surprised me <laughs> because the unabridged format was not much longer. Right. So just you know, so they actually uh, Roger Zelazny read both. He read the abridged I'm, and the uh, unabridged. I'm fairly certain the, the CBC one was abridged, even though uh, it was relatively short as well. Oh, I did not know uh, CBC did uh, the Amber books. No, 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 no. I'm oh. talking about the Bellwether. Oh, okay. So, CBC did an abridged version of Bellwether. Yeah, for um, uh, the radio show. Okay. Um, the book reading radio show called um, Between the Covers. Gotcha. They're, they're also promising to release that Robert Sawyer novel, Wake. Oh. Uh, and presumably as a abridged, uh, I can't remember offhand. Uh, but I thought it was going to be sometime soon. But wh when is the book coming out? Wake. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know for certain. It's I coming right it's up, soon. I think. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully they'll get it on. I uh, the schedule hasn't been updated for CBC, so I'm gonna have to right send an email or something. Yeah, and, and it's going to be released on audio as well. Um, I saw on Robert J. Sawyer's blog that he recorded some intro material or, or some kind of material for it. Uh, yeah, I also got an email from Steve Feldberg about that. Okay. Um, I can't remember what he said, but um, yeah, just it is definitely coming from Audible. Good. Yeah. That's one I'm looking forward to. I uh, I I've grown to I like Robert J. Sawyer more and more. When after hearing him, he's uh, he's a distinctive voice. Uh, you know, I can't I can't think of any other novels that are really like his. 
just trying to spot the schedule here. Um, okay, so that's January, February. What's the date today? 20 22nd. 22nd. Okay, so Canada Reads starts uh, February 25th. Um, and that's a contest to see whose book is best. Um, and let's see, what about March? Might be March. King Leary. Okay. Oh, that's read by Michael Hogan. Oh, no. Yeah, Michael Hogan. You know him? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's been Battlestar Galactica. King Leary, which is not science fiction, unfortunately. Ooh, that reminds me. I have an episode of Battlestar Galactica to watch. Hope it TiVo'd. <laughs> Man, that's a good show. <laughs> well, it was good, and then something happened, and I guess, in the third season or something made me off it. Yeah, well, it's back on. Okay. <laughs> they did kind of go through a, a little dip there, um, but it got really good again. So. Yeah, they, they don't have a schedule past um, just the very, you know, the next month. So, could be early spring for right. uh, that. Well, I'll, I'll see if I can find out. Um, I've been listening to uh, a lot of short stuff lately. Uh -huh. One of the things I I heard I posted about um, quite like it. It's a uh, um, an, something I found on Internet Archive. It's actually from a podcast, but I can't find it in the podcast feed, so I didn't attach the link. Um, there's a guy who's got a podcast called um, it's called uh, the Story Spieler podcast. I've actually posted about him before. Uh, the guy's name is Roy Turnbull, and he he's reading some uh, public domain uh, science fiction from Astounding and Galaxy. Um, and uh, one of the stories he's called And All the Earth a Grave. And it sounds really familiar. It's probably from Shakespeare or something, that line. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds totally memorable. Um, but the story is actually uh, not related to that at all. Um, it's really funny. It's really funny. Do you know about um, the story of the Space Merchants by um, oh, yeah. Cole and C.M. Cornbluth? Cornbluth, yep. Right. Sure uh, that's one that really needs to be audiobooked, by the way. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, that's a story about uh, marketers, um, advertising men. And they are trying to convince people to move to Venus, I believe, um, mm -hmm. so that they can, you know, make money, <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess, uh, selling them products and stuff. Um, and this is kind of a similar story. Uh, it's told um, very, uh, without, without very much detail at all. So the, one of the, I guess, the, the main character in this story, if there is a main character, is unnamed. Um, and we don't actually hear any dialogue from him um, at all. It's all told um, very casually, uh, as if um, the person who's who's telling the story heard it from one, an, another person, and that and that person heard it from another person. So it's giving the general story, but not a lot of the you know scenic details. But the idea is that. Um, one day, a computer uh, in a um, large manufacturing company of some kind um, accidentally uh, slips a cog or, you know, bounces a transistor or something like that, and it slips uh, a figure two decimal places, which ends up giving uh, the marketing department of this company or one part of this company a uh, hundred times as much uh, of a budget as he was expecting. Mm -hmm. as the guy who's running the budget is expecting. And and so the computer said it's true, it must be right. Uh, so they all go with it and uh, ends up killing everyone on Earth. <laughs> 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 because uh, it's the marketing department for the coffin industry. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, so suddenly an ad appears. Um, first, the first ad appears, shows a woman unwrapping a Christmas present. It's a beautiful new coffin, and she's so happy in the picture. And people say, "Yeah, you know what? That'd be a good present." And eventually, the new status symbol becomes 
uh, the coffin. And everybody's buying the coffin. And by January, um, everybody's got at least two or three coffins in their home. Um, hmm. And uh, after a month or so to let people move the coffins to a separate part of their house, uh, a new marketing campaign comes up. Um, that is to use the coffins. Uh, because if you, the coffins don't get used, how can you sell m new coffins, right? Right, right. Um, and so they start showing beautiful, uh, beautiful people um, dying very young, gorgeously in their coffins uh, in the commercials. And, of course, people start following <laughs> like commercials, right? Um, right? And it says, you know, it's it's a really good thing because it was really good for the economy. The economy was in a downturn. It's actually very uh, timely. Uh -huh. um, I thought I thought it was just hilarious. That's cool. Yeah, it's called All the and All the Earth a Grave, and the uh, author is uh, someone named C. C. McCap, but uh, I think that's a um, pseudonym. Okay. Sounds good. Mm hmm. What have you been listening to? I'm listening to 20th Century Ghosts by Joe Hill. It's a short story collection. Mm -hmm. It came out a while ago. It did. It did. It's been um, sitting on my shelf for a while, and um, I've been in the mood for some short stuff as well after the long stuff I've heard lately, and uh, it's it's remarkable. I'm three stories in is all, and uh, <laughs> it's it's hard to describe, but... <clears throat> There's a story in there about a, a ghost who haunts a movie theater. Um, that's the second story. And the, the third story is called Pop Art. And um, I don't think I've ever heard anything about it. The, the first line is something like, My best friend um, in junior high was inflatable. <laughs> and he's got this friend who's inflatable. And, it, and it's a genuine person. Um, you know, and he's got... A, he can't speak. He has to write his, you know, whatever he wants to say on a piece of paper. And uh, <laughs> if he gets squeezed, you know, you hear a little sigh out of him. Um, <laughs> kids, mean kids, try to kick him around, and they kick him in the air like a balloon. And um, anyway, it's a very tragic story. <laughs> oh, um, it sounds pretty good. Yeah, it's it's really terrific. It's just so bizarre. Um, but but I'd very like well done. Read your review of that if you're to do one. Yep, I will. That's, cool. that's for review, you bet. Cool, cool. So. Yeah, I haven't read anything by Joe Hill. I think I might have heard one of that collection. I think one was released for free. Uh-huh. Um, on a podcast or on Oh, a podcast. yeah. Maybe Audible's iTunes. got some stuff. Yeah, Audible's... iTunes released one or Audible released one for free. Yeah. Um, he wrote one novel called Heart Shaped Box, which was really, really good. But I, I didn't hear it on audio. I read it in print. Um, and I'm pretty sure that an audio version exists. Um, I should look that up, but it's a ghost story about um, there's a, it's a retired hard rock star who um, buys, he, he likes to collect uh, occultish things. So on, on uh, some online auction site, he finds a um, suit jacket that's supposed to be um, haunted. Mm -hmm. So he buys it, you know, thinking, hey, this will look great in my collection. So he buys it, and of course it is haunted. And uh, from there, it's it's a ghost story. Um, I'd say there's nothing really atypical about it, but it is just extremely well done. Extremely well done. Very, um, very scary. <laughs> is uh, Joe Hill someone um, people would know other than by his books? Um, yeah, he's Stephen King's son. Yeah, that, that's um, that, that what was, I was thinking. Yeah, it was revealed, you know, he, he's been writing under Joe Hill for quite some time, and then somebody found out who he was and then published that. Um, but of course, you know, I can totally understand why he'd want to do that. But his, his full name is Joseph Hillstrom King, as I understand it. Cool. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think, you know, what do you think, like, when... Stephen King's your dad, and he's reading you a bedtime story. What do you think the kind of story you would get would be <laughs> as I a don't kid? Know. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. Yeah, I wonder too. I think he would be enthusiastic about whatever he was reading. Yes. Um, yeah. Stephen King reads a lot of stuff. He's not, you know, he's a voracious reader. Learned that from uh, 
that On Writing, which is another, that is a great audiobook, by the way, On Writing by Stephen King, read by Stephen King. If you're a Stephen King fan, you should really check that out. Um, did you write a review for that? That was a while I, ago. I don't know if I ever did. That'd be interesting. Yeah, I should listen to it again. I mean, it, it's just, it's a, it's an incredibly personal look at his writing life, you know, and there's some biographical information in there and uh, writing advice in there and uh, stories about, uh, you know, what was going on when he was writing his stuff. Um, like uh, the stand, I, I recall a part in the when he was talking about the stand, um, him reaching an impasse and then going for a walk and uh, it coming to him how to finish it mm -hmm. and uh, him running home so he didn't forget it. <laughs> Run home to write it down. That makes sense. Yeah. So, um, but extremely personal and and it's read by Stephen King so it's like you know he's sitting across the kitchen table talking to you about it. Yeah, I I I like those books. Uh, I'm not using them for um, you know uh, tips on how to write stuff, but um, I remember listening to the Lawrence Block one. Uh, he actually wrote a couple books on on writing, but um, there's an audiobook version, uh, Telling Lies for Fun and Profit, which hmm. was uh, very enjoyable. Cool. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, I, I wrote a review for uh, Inferno, posted that. Oh, yep, yeah, saw that. Um, I've been reading about the sequel, which is coming, called Escape from Hell. Um, I'm not sure there's an audiobook version, but I would assume there would be, uh -huh. um, given that it's just coming out as a paper yeah, book it would be right uh, now. Blackstone, I think. Blackstone yeah, you would think so. Um, uh, the early reviews I've read of it, uh, the sequel, um, make it sound mediocre at best I guess but um, I like the the pairing of Jerry Pornell and Larry Niven um, yeah well I do too L Lucifer's Hammer was a book I read a long 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 time ago and loved it I know uh, that was on audio but it, it was a uh, early books on tape title right and uh, uh, had poor narration if I remember right <laughs> but I, I don't think you can get it now I don't, I don't know where well. you can find it could look around, I guess. Yeah. Um, but and footfall. Footfall is another one. Footfall, uh, another one needs to be on audio. Yeah, that really ought to be. That that was a landmark. And Mo Moat in God's Eye. I know Which they, is they also have not a, available. Yeah, wasn't it abridged? Uh, Didn't you? No, review? that that was the sequel. Uh, oh, it was abridged. Yeah. And okay. um, I from just listening to the abridged sequel, I really want to hear their original. Uh huh. Because the abridged sequel had really good writing in it, but it was really hard to follow. Uh -huh. and the story was really interesting, but I couldn't tell what was going on because it was so abridged. Uh, it was four cassettes it probably should have been ten. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I I quite like the book. It's not um, it's it's not um, it's not got a lot of mysterious elements in the except in the you know we don't find out enough about uh why uh the main character is in hell how he mm -hmm. ends up in hell um we sort of know he he's a sinner in the small sense but he doesn't seem to belong there um in any particular part you know a lot of the people he meets there are very evil uh -huh. uh, or you know he hears about uh, you know people who are there who probably deserve to be there. There also s seems to be a lot of people there who who don't deserve to be there, and so um, he's pretty uh, he's pretty uh, mad at uh, God uh -huh. or whoever for creating this place. But we don't get enough um, enough explanation outside of the um, of the the book you know like we can't um get a, a scene of revelation when he gets out of hell and suddenly you say ah here's the here, here's the a real story here's the real explanation and in a way that feels sort of unsatisfactory but um it's probably a little bit realistic too i i, I would assume mm -hmm. given that 
if hell exists, they're probably not going to be a guy giving you an explanation for why you're there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain. That I, would make it more hellish if you didn't know why. Uh, the other thing I had trouble with is um, classifying this book because it's clearly um, it's clearly a Bangsian fantasy in that it's set in the afterlife, uh -huh. um, which would make it a fantasy, right? Right. Um, uh, but on the other hand, the writer, uh, the main character is a science fiction writer, and he he tries to impose a a very science fictional sort of a hard SF um, explanation on everything he sees, uh -huh. and that makes it feel like like you know he's trying to explain away uh, why the um, <laughs> why they don't seem to have any mass. Uh -huh. <laughs> they have weight, but they don't have mass. Huh. Uh, they, you know, they die only in the sense that they can be injured, but they can't be killed. So, yeah. you know, if you're in a, a plane crash in hell, um, your body is twisted and burnt. Uh, well, it just comes back together, and it's very painful. Um, they also don't need to eat or sleep. Um, so, why, you know, how can a how can a uh, a rational mind uh, assuming the laws of physics as as they exist on Earth um, explain this away. It's pretty hard. Mm -hmm. uh, but he goes he, he goes about halfway through the book before he, you know he's convinced that he's definitely in hell. <laughs> <laughs> he calls it he calls it Inferno Land, like Disneyland. <laughs> it's oh, a yeah. giant creation of a um, of a uh, you know a mad alien or something like it. Mm -hmm. Ask people for some unknown reason, um, and it's it's very interesting the way um, that that comes about. The one of the things that bugged me about the book uh, packaging was they give a spoiler um, right in the the text of of uh, what the book's about. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would figure most people would have figured it out on their own, but it's not nice to have it confirmed by the actual packaging. So, uh -huh. I don't know. Gotcha. What do you think about uh, spoiling the book on the back, giving details? Uh, I'm gonna. gonna I, I wish that they would not. You know, um, I always read the back. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I knew a guy in college who used to read the last chapter of every book before he read the rest. What? I'm serious. That was why. I, I don't know, but he did. Every, you know, he was a voracious reader. Read all the time. And he'd go to the store, buy a pile of paperbacks, and then that's where he'd start. He'd start with the last chapter. What a cheater. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, I should find him and contact him and find out if he still does. <laughs> you know, what I will do sometimes, which is actually kind of similar, is I read the first line and the last line of a book. Uh huh. The first sentence and the last sentence of a book, huh. um, if I'm considering... Buying, buying a paper book. Oh, why would you do that? Well, because um, uh, generally you don't get a spoiler um, in the last sentence. Uh -huh. You get a spoiler in the last chapter, but not in the last sentence. And um, uh, the way you can tell if a book is good is if its sentence is opening well, right? If uh -huh. it opens well, uh, it probably has a good uh, narrative. Um, and if it closes, I'm not... Um, he would have to wait until the next day, right? Something like that, telling you that it's a, a series. Oh, I, I want to avoid a series. Uh, uh, I see. <laughs> I want a, a nice, neat bow on the end. Ah, uh, right. I, I I don't like series novels that much, so. Gotcha. Um, right. Well, I, I always read the back. If it's an author I have not read, you know, there's some authors that I just buy no matter what it is. Um, but if it's an author I haven't read, I always read the back, and then I read. The first couple of paragraphs in the bookstore, mm. and then if I like it, I buy it. You know what's really not good to read if you're what's trying that? to avoid spoilers? Wikipedia. Man, oh yes, Wikipedia. It's full of spoilers. I know. I know. I, I don't yeah. like that. I, I like. I was just looking up a couple of the Philip K. Dick stories that I, I've been uh, listening to in the um, new uh, selected stories of Philip K. Dick collection. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, 
uh, luckily I looked them up after I I listened to them. I was I was just trying to get some details on um, uh, confirming some suspicions, and um, just spoils the whole story. Doesn't give any any thought. Like it doesn't even say spoilers. You know this this website may contain spoilers. I, I guess yeah. I guess it's just you have to figure that out. Uh, <laughs> mind you, it makes sense. It is a an encyclopedia. Uh huh. Um, you know, if they're going to give you the history of World War II, they're not going to say, and you'll have to wait and find out who wins. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But, yeah, one of the things I was looking up, I was looking up a short story by Philip K. Dick called um, The Exit Door Leads In. And I'm not going to give any spoilers, but I will say um, I was kind of surprised while I was listening to it. It's got a lot of swearing in it, mm -hmm. which is not typical of Philip K. Dick. He... he uh, ha there are, there have been a couple novels where he's got uh, um, a naughty line here or there, um, but I thought this is unusual. There must be some explanation for it because it doesn't seem to be a radically different story other than that. Uh -huh. um, and so I I uh, I thought maybe it was like a, um, some sort of for some special anthology or something. So I looked it up. Apparently it was sold uh, to a magazine called Rolling Stone uh, College College Papers, which was mm -hmm. a short-lived, I'm assuming it was a short-lived uh, fiction magazine spinoff of Rolling Stone. Mm -hmm. um, and it said that it was a, um, I, think it, I think it was on Wikipedia that it said that, um, that it was a, uh, a special commission for from that paper. Um, and I'm assuming that's because very recently, uh, oh well, I, I, not very recently, but around the same time, um, Philip K. Dick was interviewed for a Rolling Stone article, uh -huh. um, very famous one, um, that is uh, available now online as well. Um, somebody scanned it in as a PDF. Oh. Uh, let's see, I can't get the date on there. It's not there. Anyways, it's been scanned in as a PDF, and it's a... Uh, very confabulous um, article. It's called "The True Stories of Philip K. Dick," um, uh, and then it's the subtitle: "Burgling the most brilliant sci-fi mind on Earth is—is is it Earth? Isn't it?" Um, by Paul Williams. And this is a very famous um, uh, article. So if you're a Philip K. Dick fan, you're probably going to want to snap it up. Uh -huh. I'll send a link to it in the show notes. Okay, great. <laughs> going to post a review of Starship uh, Rebel, I think. Mike Resnick. Yeah. And that's uh, got a, an essential, which is kind of strange, given that the first, second, and third books don't have it. Uh -huh. But this, you got to treat this this uh, one like it's like um, Babylon 5. You know how Babylon 5, the first season, it's, eh, it's okay. Second right, season, right. hey, this is pretty good. Third season, wow. Fourth season, hey! <laughs> this season, all oh. <laughs> right. So, um, it, it's it, he's just ramped it up, um, and uh, I uh, only spoiler I'll give for um, for this uh, this book is one of the major characters from the series gets killed, huh. which I think is cool. Nobody's yeah. safe. In fact, wow. at least one. Of the major characters is killed. Yes, um, which I think really makes a difference to making a book good is putting people in jeopardy. Yeah, yeah. Especially in a series, my God, that's so important. <laughs> but George R. R. Martin is to me the king of uh, killing characters off. I mean, talk about no one being safe. That's that's George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire. <laughs> Because it's like you'd really fall in love with a character and then gone. Well, you know, he probably he probably needs to kill them off. He's got so many in a book. Yeah, yeah. Just to make room. <laughs> yeah, those are sure great books. Uh, Fell at the convention called them uh, called them heroic fantasy, meaning light on the magic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely not. Uh, Sword and sorcery. It's more sword and uh, conversation. Right, right. 
political intrigue mostly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just find them they're too long. Oh, I, I love them. I, I wouldn't change them. When, when are we gonna see the TV series? Um, I understand just from reading his blog, you know. So I, I hope I've got this right. Um, it is not official yet. They've, they're, they're in. They're, they're cleared to make a pilot. Oh, they, so they make the pilot, and then um, HBO gets to choose between them and probably a few others to decide which one to do. So it's not a done deal that it's actually going to happen, but they are to the, you know, we're going to film a pilot phase. Mm. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's at least a year off if it's going to happen. Okay. Well, until then, I guess you got the books. That's right. That's right. Um, I was I reading something ab about his latest one, people complaining about the oh, lateness. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's a yeah. cover for it, though, right? There's a cover for it, you bet. Yeah. He's hard at work on it. He's got a post up on his uh, his blog, you know, the he does one every now and then. This is where it's at, you know, folks, so please stop writing me letters. <laughs> but this oh, is where it's just at. Just make them shorter. Why can't he write some short stuff? I like his short fiction. Oh yeah, I love his short fiction. Yeah. I love gosh, everything I've read by him I've really liked. I don't I can't think of anything I haven't. Um I sure haven't read everything he's written though. Um, the wild cards stuff that's out, um, which seems, you know, wild cards seems like it'd make really good audio. Um, n not having read it, but it seems like it would be popular. Yeah, it sounds, um, um just because of the subject matter. It sounds very topical. Yeah, so. Superheroes, etc., right? Right, right. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I sure like him. Well, maybe there's a way to uh, make it happen. I mean, really, he's uh, he's taking too long uh, to to release them. I mean, to release the Song of Ice and Fires. Yeah, I mean, it's too long. If, if how, uh, it's not a year apart, right? It's it's like two years apart. Um. Yeah, I think the last one was a couple of years ago. So that's outside of the um, outside of the um, speed by which you want your audio or your irregular books delivered, um, there's got to be a way to uh, speed it up. So how about this? Stop writing long stuff, start writing shorter stuff. Why Why? why do books have to be so long? Why, why does he well, have to on that one, that one I understand why it's long. It's, uh, um, it's a truly epic thing. I mean, if it was short, I don't, you know, when I read uh, like a Game of Thrones or or uh, one of those books. I can't imagine cutting any of that out of there. I gotta um, tell you though, like uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey would fit inside of one of those. Yeah, but still, I mean, what are you gonna cut out of a Game of Thrones? I, you know, maybe a lot of the dialogue. But the dialogue is all, <laughs> you know, you were just saying that it's conversation and uh, sword and conversation. Yeah, too much conversation, not enough sword. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, I know you like it. Uh, I think it's okay. It's just too long. No, I don't think it's too long it's, at it all. It feels, it feels like it's no, a death. I'm not, edit. I'm not a big fan of big giant, you know, giant books, you know. That, but I, I do like some, like The Stand by Stephen King, um, Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings is really one book, right? Yeah. Those, I wouldn't touch those books. But, uh, but that even those two things you've just cited are shorter than, you know. Two of those, two of those things put together. Uh, I guess I missed your point there. That I'm I saying these books are getting too long. The, 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 I mean, the content, of the actual events that happen inside, are uh -huh. short. Are are not as long as the book. The the scenes are are dragged out. The detail is too much. It's leaving not enough. No, but that, that's isn't that why people read, you know, epic fantasy and historical fiction are really, to me, you know, twins, mm -hmm. right? They are. So, but that's the point of an epic fantasy or a piece of historical fiction is the the setting. It's very important. And if you have, you know, why why don't we see uh, a lot of uh, fantasy novellas or fantasy 
Uh, I'm talking about epic fantasy. Yeah. You know, uh, we, we don't see novelettes, short stories. You know, they're all novels. And, and the reason is, is because the reason that they exist is because you're going somewhere and you're experiencing a place as much as a story. Uh, yeah. So that's why. That's why they're long. <laughs> People want them that way. I think I think there there is a certain percentage of the audience who wants really long stuff, and that's why they are getting longer. And books are getting. I mean, books are. I don't know. Smart. I don't know. I would disagree with you that books are getting longer in general. I don't. I don't think that's true. I, I I'm afraid they are. Just just go to a bookstore and look at the 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 stuff now, and then go to a used bookstore and see the book books that are no, well, there. Let, let's look at some incredibly popular things. Uh, the yeah. Graveyard Book. Uh, Coraline, okay, those okay. are fan fantasies, very short, and and they're children's fantasy too. Oh sure, okay, okay, um, but uh, let's let's just compare one one series, okay? Let's look at uh, Harry Potter. Uh huh. Okay, Harry Potter one. Right. Is half the size of the next book in the series. Harry um, Potter two. Is you know, it's really one two and one two and first... yeah, one two and three are are fairly small, and then. No, they keep Brief. they increase in size by doubling. The first one. No, is that's not true. That's not true. I, I I see your point though. They get bigger as they go on, but I'm looking at them right now. And, and bigger uh, and bigger and bigger. I no, think the, the last the, one might not be quite as big as the sixth book was shorter than the last one. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, the, no, what the very happened last was J.K. Rowling. Be... J.K. Rowling got famous enough and powerful enough to be able to write at the length that she felt like it needed to be. I guess so, but uh -huh. is that really what, what, <laughs> no, are they getting were, better? If you were a YA, you're selling YA fiction, you're a publisher, you want, do you want it to be 600 pages long? The answer is no, you do not. So, uh, it, depends on, it was the same thing, you know, with Stephen King, when he was early, you know, he talks about the stand, and how, you know, yeah, it needs to be a thousand pages long, but they're only giving him 600, and the first version of the stand that came out was cut to that length mm -hmm. right so the, the the publisher does not want it to be that big okay um, one of the things that I, I learned in the, the convention I was just at is you know 120,000 words is about where a, a first novel should be um, that's kind of what the current what they're currently looking for you know Brandon Sanderson's first novel was 240,000 how many pages is uh, 120,000 words? 120,000 is, let's see, so really it's about 250 pages. Right, which is, that that is about uh, at least 50 pages longer than books used to be. Yes. Okay, well that's true. That's true. Books are getting longer. And I think the reason is, is... But it's, it's epic, like a, epic fantasy books are getting longer. I not don't just think, not just fantasy. It's science fiction and uh, horror. Everything's so, getting longer. Though. Like what? Like I mean, Robert J. Sawyer's books are all what two hundred fifty pages, three hundred pages. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think you bringing him up is a good thing because I'm going to tell you why his books are that long. Okay. I, I don't know that I've read this on his website or anything, but I, I have a good idea why they're that long because that's how thick the rack is at the at the checkout, right? <laughs> Ideally, the, no, the, um, you can fit two, bo two books, two paperback books, in one of these racks. If it doesn't fit in that rack, it can't sell there. He, he wants to be, I think he might have said this somewhere, um, he wants to be, you know, the airport guy, the guy who you pick up a book and take it on the airplane. Mm -hmm. you, know, you read it on, on your vacation, you, you want to be at the checkout, because at the checkout, that's where you make your money, right? Uh -huh. You can actually be, uh, you know, a full-time writer if you're able to get in those selected spots. To be in those selected spots, you can't have a book that's uh, outside of the variation of the size. Right? So, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, Jer George R. R. Martin's books are not going to fit into that little rack. But he's also not mainstream popular um, in that everybody, you know, like Oprah's recommending this book. This is uh, niche, but it's it's very popular within its niche. He's sort of got a certain market cornered, but the the size of the racks actually determines what books are going to go in there, and 
that is determined by the audience, what the audience buys, and also what, you know, what profits come. If, you, if you're selling a book right now, we're charging $10 for a paperback book, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, if you're charging that much, you better have more than 100 pages. Otherwise, people start doing the math, right? Right, yeah. So uh, what I'm saying is the, the sweet spot in the pricing of books is, the, is helping determine how long the books should be rather than, you know, what, what's good for the books. I, I think the size is wrong in many cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, just look at look the size of uh, Inferno. It's uh, f uh, five CDs. Well, I, I'm gonna, I haven't looked at it yet, but I'm going to bet that the sequel, which is just coming out 33 years later or however long it was, I think that's right, 33 years after, is going to be at least double the size. Interesting. It's going to be yeah, at least we'll nine out. or ten CDs long, uh -huh. and it, or uh, you know, double the size of the paperback, which mm -hmm. I've got is very, very slim, standard mm -hmm. size for the 1970s, I guess. Now there were, um, I mean, you can make the argument that uh, books should be longer as a natural evolution or something like that, because in the 70s and the 60s, books were thinner, mm -hmm. um, and that was just the the size of the rack back then or something? I don't know. Yeah, but there, there were giant shelf busters then, too. You know, Shogun. Uh, Shogun leads to mine. Yeah, well, I think that's probably the beginning of the trend of longer books. Because even Shogun is not as long as, as uh, one of the Song of Ice and Fire books. And Shogun's a hefty, well, hefty Shogun, book. Shogun is like a thousand pages long. Yeah, it's a hefty book. It's a spine yeah. breaker, right? It, yeah. It's... I mean, the physical size of books is... Uh, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see what the digital book will do to, uh, to the size of books, because it doesn't have to be... Uh, I, think, I think it's going to make them... You know, if there's going to be a trend, it's going to be shorter. I don't know. You, I you, think would, so. think, you would think that it could... It certainly could go that way, right? Yeah, I, I still... You know, people haven't discovered, in, in my opinion, that there needs to be a market for the novelette. Or the Absolutely. novella. The novella is just about my favorite length of story. You know, 100 pages is perfect. Um, but, you know, people driving on commutes and things, you know, with electronic readers, I mean, that's perfect size. It's also the perfect size audiobook. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> but, yeah. but um, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure that my complaint is, uh, you know, we can do anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, all I can do is buy older books, I guess, rather than buying newer books. But the uh, the trend seems to be a, a negative one for. What I'm saying is is the quality is going down because of it. Because if you if you look at a book like uh, I Am Legend, it's a you know 125 pages at most, mm -hmm. right? It's got a whole lot of story in there, right? Uh, more than movie length, you know the movie. Uh, cut down it uh, on it, uh, and the three times that it's been done as a movie, it's been cut down. The story's been cut down, and yet um, now we're getting, you know, the Da Vinci Code is at least 300 pages, and that's a they jam everything into that movie. I'm not saying that movies are determining the length. I'm saying that it seems that the storytelling should be of a of a an appropriate size for the for the kind of story you're telling. And I, I understand, like, the book you're, you're talking about, the um, Song of Ice and Fire series, is epic fantasy, therefore it should be longer, because you're getting, you have to invent the whole world. Mm -hmm. um, the story of Lord of the Rings has to be told in a uh, quite a large format, because it's, it's, uh, it's a, re a relatively long story, um, spanning years and or at least nine months or whatever it is um, that's it's got a lot of stuff to say right but yeah. I think how many how many books are there in the song of ice and fire seven um, right now there's four, four I think there's supposed to be seven but he's seven uh, yeah seven or eight or eight yes. because the, you have to break up one of them mm -hmm. um, is the story um, grander and I'm not saying that in the sense of uh, better. I'm just saying, is it a bigger kind of story than Lord of the Rings? 
there are possibly the same number of characters or similar number of characters. No, I mean, I don't see it as any different than a long television series, you know? Season after season. Each book is a season. I mean, that's the way they're going to film it, but... Yeah. Um, I think that's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, it is. Because um, I, I think I think that that's, that's a way to th- of thinking about t- TV shows versus movies. Um, uh, when I watched the the um, season of that vampire show, what's it called? True Blood? Oh, uh-huh. Um, I had read the book. Um, I actually felt it was a little drawn out in the in the television show. Mm-hmm. But um, in the course of the events of the, the show, it actually is um, quite short. Like, it only takes place over a week or so. Um, it feels drawn out, I guess, because it's a television show, and, you know, you could wait a week and then you watch it, wait a week and then you watch it. But um, it actually worked fairly well um, it might be that television is a better fit for these longer books this has been the SFF audio podcast please join us at www.sffaudio.com